what crystal healing looks like. Person's overall vitality and aliveness Today's was a function of, of human and atmospheric orgone charge and pulsation, and this could often be increased by sitting inside the orgone Geoengineering is the phrase that has emerged kingdom. to describe this activity. The skies have been strangely clear and free of the crisscrossing patterns and afternoon haze. The seeming cessation of spraying corresponded almost to the day with President Donald Trump's announcement that he was pulling the United States out of the Paris climate The biggest agreement. problem with nuclear energy is not the risk of meltdown, it's not the supply of uranium, it's this, nuclear waste. So what does crystal healing, chemtrails, and orgon energy have to do with the problem of nuclear waste? They're all myths. Hello, and welcome to the third edition of the Eco Modernist Soapbox. Our topic for today is the myth of nuclear waste. Yes, you heard me. It's a myth, a fairy tale, a delusion, a tall story, a fabrication. It's all of those things. And there's absolutely no evidence of spent fuel from any operating nuclear reactor causing harm to humans or the environment. Anywhere. Ever. Spent fuel canisters are built to withstand the worst traffic accident. As to the toxicity, this is not a problem either, and never was, because the nuclear industry is the only industry that encases their spent fuel. The total amount of spent fuel on the planet would fit onto a football field without getting any higher than the goalposts. If it were placed without any protection in a dry location far enough away from civilization, it would still be no problem. There's no solid evidence of harmful health effects from exposure lower than 100 millisieverts per year. Therefore, any leaching into a remote dry environment that might occur has an extremely poor chance of background radiation level. Keep in mind that the mantle of the Earth is highly radioactive and both uranium and plutonium leach into the oceans and the aquifers naturally. That is why it is the conclusion of the scientific community that Yucca Mountain and other similar depositories are fully capable of storing spent fuel from nuclear reactors. The real radiation problem comes from waste from the mining of rare earth metals for wind and solar, and from the waste from coal plants, both of which have been shown to be more radioactive than nuclear waste. In China's Zhejiang province in Haining City, over 500 villagers stormed a solar panel manufacturing company, overturning vehicles and destroying offices. They are accusing the factory of pollution. The villagers started protesting on Thursday when they invaded the Jinko Solar Holding Company complex. Angry protesters overturned eight company vehicles and four police cars before being dispersed. Now, solar silicon processing involves the use or release of the following chemicals. Phosphine, arsenic, arsenine, trichloroethane, phosphorus oxychloride, ethyl vinyl acetate, silicon trioxide, stannic chloride, tantalium pentoxide, lead, and hexavalent chromium. Even the newer thin film technologies that we see coming online contain cadmium, which is considered an extreme toxin by the EPA. Solar cell manufacturing plants are one of the largest emitters of these three greenhouse gases. Hexafluoroethane, nitrogen trifluoride, and sulfur hexafluoride. These are used to make solar cells, and they make CO2 look harmless. These greenhouse gases are man-made. They are 10,000 to 25,000 times more virulent than CO2, according to the IPCC. The solar photovoltaic industry is one of the leading and fastest growing emitters of these gases. Now what do we do with this at the end of its life? If we incinerate it, that stuff goes into the air, and that's no good. If we bury it, it will inevitably end up in the groundwater supply. And none of this stuff biodegrades, leaving us with the same type of predicament that we have with nuclear waste. But not only is spent fuel not dangerous, it is very valuable. And here to talk about it in the next segment is famed scientist Dr. Kurt Sorensen. 
Dr. Sorensen, like I'm here from Teleni Brown Engineering in Huntsville, Alabama, and we've been involved in nuclear work for a number of years. A kilogram of fissile material will release as much energy as like 13,000 barrels of oil. You know, if you remember nothing else, this is why we care. This is why nuclear energy matters. This is because it's a very, very energy dense way to go about producing energy. So when you talk to people about nuclear energy, a lot of times they say, okay, well, what about the waste? Is that a real problem? And, you know, what's involved? So I have been spending a number of weeks and months trying to learn a lot more about, well, what the heck is in spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste, as it's sometimes called. I then got really curious about what was being made. So I wrote a simulation, typical uranium fuel, and I took my computer code and I burned it. And then you go and you essentially drop all this stuff in the computer and you say, okay, what's there? Okay, so I'm going to try to start running this simulation. And the first thing we see is, okay, most of the radioactivity is Neptunium-239. Well, what's that? Well, that's uranium that's about to become plutonium, which is potentially future fuel. People are scared of radiation. And I think, okay, what is it about spent nuclear fuel that could harm me? And I found something that really, really surprised me. So let me reset the simulation here, and, and I'll take it out about 15 years. Now, here's what I found that surprised me so much is that we could address spent nuclear fuel in a very different way from what we're doing now and potentially reduce the risk substantially by taking exactly one thing out of the spent nuclear fuel, and that is cesium. So kind of an intriguing result. Okay, so I've showed you that, and I want to jump back and talk about xenon and neodymium. Xenon stabilizes in just a few months, so you could go and extract all the xenon from spent nuclear fuel, and it is completely non-radioactive. It's got a typical value about $1,200 per kilogram. At NASA, we use it in ion engines, and you can use it in light bulbs, and you can use it in energy-efficient windows. And so a metric ton of uranium could have about $7,700 worth of, of xenon in it. The next most common fission product is neodymium. This is a great thing because in the 80s, we discovered how to make super strong magnets from neodymium. So this is the number two thing that comes out of spent nuclear fuel. And the other great thing about it is it stabilizes really quickly, too. Then there's another category of stuff we might be able to get. It'd take about 10 to 15 years to reach a level of no radioactivity. Ruthenium, rhodium, and palladium, all of these are potential catalysts, and they have much higher valuations. Ruthenium's worth about $6,300 a kilogram, and uh, rhodium's worth $90,000 a kilogram, and that number fluctuates. Palladium is also very valuable. Now, ironically, some of the most valuable things in spent nuclear fuel, if it could be reprocessed quickly, are the things that are really radioactive and don't hang around very long. One of them is molybdenum-99, and that is used in medical treatments. It's used to create technetium-99, which people ingest, so people are able to use this for diagnostic procedures. I was talking to an elderly crowd a couple of months ago, and I said, raise your hand if you've drunk Tech-99M. And I would say about half the people in the room raised their hand <laughs> and said, yeah, I've, I've drunk it, you know. So this is something that, that we use to save lives all the time. Another one is iodine-131. It's also used for medical treatments. It doesn't last very long. It has an eight-day half-life. So if you want it, you got to get it and use it pretty quickly. Then there's also medium-lifetime products like strontium and cesium, which have enough radioactivity to last for a while. But because of that, you know, I'm thinking like a NASA guy, we could use these for radioisotope heat sources for deep space probes. We could also use cesium-134 and 137 to irradiate food and to destroy pathogens. Food irradiation is a process that does not induce radiation in food. It does not lead to residual risk, but what it will do is it will destroy some very difficult pathogens. Look at the people who are killed by E. coli each year. So I think it's on the order of several thousand people die each year from E. coli. That's something that we could stop with widespread use of food irradiation. So even these very radioactive radioisotopes may be valuable. And then there's also the uranium and the transuranic elements. Okay, how does this all add up? The Nuclear Regulatory Commission will charge you a dollar per megawatt hour for every megawatt hour of electricity you make from nuclear power. So I got curious. I thought, could we make enough money from the fission products to pay back that dollar that we're spending on the waste fund? So I, I kind of racked and stacked these different things so if you went and summed all the fission products, you really didn't get there. You got to about, mm, you know, maybe a third of the waste fee. Then if you dropped down and you looked at saying, okay, I was going to recover the uranium, which is most of the spent nuclear fuel, that got you to about a quarter of the fee. But the really interesting one, in my mind, was the plutonium. If you could recover the plutonium and burn it up for energy, of all the ones to go and recover, 
it was the plutonium was the one that had the best chance of making money in the future by being burned up in a reactor for electricity. So what I took from all this was, is nuclear waste really waste? Well, I would say no. I don't think it's waste. I think there's a lot of very useful things in it. And I think in a culture that values the idea of reduce, reuse, recycle, it behooves us to look carefully at these. Is there enough value in the stuff that's in there now, in the way we do nuclear now, to recover the money paid in the spent fuel fee? It does not appear that there is enough value there. But there is non-trivial amounts of value, about maybe 40% of your fee. On the other hand, if you recover unburned fuel and you go burn it, there is a substantial amount of value in that. So the upshot from all this would seem to be, let's go and take the spent nuclear fuel and let's go burn up the stuff that's going to last for a long time if we don't burn it and make money selling the electricity from it. So I hope that's a takeaway. Thank you very much. And we'd like to thank you for joining us as well. And remember, it's only waste if it's wasted.